to really get a deep sense of um, just what's going on here. Just take me a moment to set this up. Some of this you'll find rather unusual because I might be exposing you to ideas that you're not familiar with. But it really is indicating a direction that global education is moving in at, at the present. So I want to explore the idea of a holistic approach to teaching and learning about the Parthenon. And in a sense that flies counter, you'll see, to the Universal Museum idea, very dramatically so. I've used Pericles here because he's so well known and he crops up in lots of studies. On the screen, I was hoping we'd have tweets. We don't have them at the moment. Uh, I was hoping that those tweets would be constructing a version of what's going on at this conference. Because a lot of what I have to say today is about what we call in education constructivism. And one other element. Now, constructing knowledge is not a linear process. Uh, if, we, if we had those tweets up there, you'd see that various people in this audience are tweeting about the conference and constructing a, a, a view, a version of, of, of reality, a story. This isn't a linear process either. In education, when we use those sorts of tools, we talk about constructivism and connectivism. Connectivism is the idea of bringing people together in an informal, ongoing collaboration. Today I want to explore opportunities for using these tools to learn about ancient Greece and about the restitution of the Parthenon sculptures. Successfully embracing and employing 21st century pedagogy presents the best opportunity for engaging with educational institutions and offering relevant insights to students, providing the students with opportunities to actively participate in developing a dynamic understanding of cultural heritage that's beyond static notions of culture as curated museum specimens. Um, it's, it's challenging, but it's very much in concert with contemporary educational practice. The so educational responses in the past um, have been most effective when they've addressed both the formal and the informal aspects of curriculum, the curriculum that schools follow. By contrast, there have been some beautiful educational materials produced about the Parthenon over the years, but all too often they've languished unused in bookshelves, in back rooms, in schools, because they don't address the curriculum. They're a beautiful artwork that you might take your grandchildren through as a story uh, around bedtime, but they don't serve the needs of contemporary education. They're just pretty. Contemporary education can be summed up, 20th century education can be summed up with this diagram. I was hoping to have a, oh, here it is. You've got a laser there, I've got one here as well. Uh, look, you all would have all gone through this particular process. You'd, you'd have done self-learning, informal learning, you'd have been in classrooms, in work groups, you'd have done drill and practice, you'd have done presentations, uh, and you'd have done these sorts of things, but probably not so much of this. And this is really the area where I want to focus today. Uh, we, we live in a world where the sort of things that kids are exposed to in particular are, are instant and global. I, I tried to put this graphic together to illustrate a blog post I wrote recently to illustrate that globalisation and the associated digital education revolution have transformed education, allowing opportunities for holistic practices and understandings. They've also led to a wider use of these notions. Constructivism, the idea of building stuff. The Lego Acropolis is a great piece of it, constructivism, although it's formal and contained because Lego designed the pieces. Um, it, it's often a personal process, constructing, uh, and it involves interaction with the outside world. Learners participate in building knowledge. The teacher becomes a facilitator. In fact, the teacher becomes a facilitator engaged in a lot more one-to-one -one, uh, interaction with the students. Constructivism can also be social, and it's important when it is social. It's not just a, a unitary or a singular activity. It actually is strengthened when we have a team uh, working on constructing the knowledge. So, 
Knowledge is constructed both by assimilation and accommodation. When assimilation occurs, everything fits together very well. When accommodation occurs, things have to change so that the new information can mesh in with the old. What this leads us into is a process that we can summarise as involving creativity, communication, collaboration, critical thinking, the four, P, the four C's they're called, but I'd add two more, global awareness and cultural literacy. Very, very important skills for the 21st century. And th th this idea has al already resonated through several presentations today. When we're approaching the study of something like the Parthenon, obviously these sorts of things would underpin uh, a general knowledge about the Parthenon. But we have to, as educators, we have to be a lot more specific. And what I want to focus on in, in the next few moments is how we might use those uh, areas of action but address the pedagogy in a slightly different way. I want to show you how we can use constructivism and social constructivism and accommodate it within a blended learning model, which is that one I initially showed you. I've sort of reframed that model so it looks a bit like this. On one side, you've got uh, what we call constructivism, and these are the tools of the 21st century. Certainly as a teacher, I work with all of these tools. But what's emerging even more importantly are the connectivist tools. And I want to focus on a few of these. I can't by any means go near looking at all of them. This is a huge area. And yet not to address it, if we fail to address it in our campaign, we will fail to engage with a whole generation of people. It's absolutely central. The Australian National Curriculum, I just want to look at it briefly. Not, not because I'm holding it up as the paradigm, but because it fits what I, my argument, in the sense that we don't just make stuff up, we have to respond to a systemic curriculum or to a school's curriculum. Here are some of the elements defining the key questions of inquiry in the National Australian History Curriculum. I don't need to go through them, they're, they're self-evident. It also suggests there are certain key concepts in history that everyone needs to assimilate and understand. Pretty straightforward, isn't it, when you think about it? They're all things that you would expect to be doing when you're studying history. Now, in terms of ancient Greece, it comes into the Australian curriculum at the beginning of middle school, what we call year seven. And these are the basic issues that are studied. Inter influence of the physical features, society, everyday life, trade colonisation, war, and a depth study on a, on a significant individual. For example, Pericles, but it could be Socrates, it could be uh, several individuals. What I'd like you to do, if you've got a device that's uh, computer connected, uh, internet connected, and you happen to have a Gmail account, is log on to that particular URL, because there you'll find a document that you can, sh you can participate in the construction of. It outlines my uh, paper today, but I'd be very happy if you inserted comments anywhere through that document that you like. In, in, you can do it now in real time. Okay, so here are the, here are the main themes that are covered in the Australian uh, curriculum as, as they apply to Athens of 5th century BCE. So I'll look at a couple of them. Because I'm a geographer, uh, I tend to be very seduced by the physical context. Uh, and I've taken this fragment from uh, the internet. Uh, it's a beautiful, beautiful piece of marble, but it has Greek writing on it that I can't understand, so it has many levels of meaning here. Uh, now, it's ancient Greek, I guess. But what I'd like to look at, just for a moment, are the physical context. Is the physical context. That's plate tectonics, it's geomorphology, it's climatology, it's solar energy. Just a few things. Now you're all familiar with this particular image. This is from Google Earth. And I think everyone here has probably been and to, to this place and climbed over it and been across to Philippos Hill and so forth and looked at other uh, views of the Parthenon. But as we zoom out, you're probably less aware of what's about to emerge. And what's about to emerge is something absolutely fundamental if we want to understand context. It's the Athenian plate. There it is. 
And there are very interesting th things happening with the Athenian plate. And as we zoom out further, you don't get a very good view uh, from Google Earth about what's happening with the Athenian plate. But if I take you to a schematic diagram, you will. And it's here. We see that the Athenian plate is actually being worked on by surrounding plates. Down here there's a huge African plate. Over here we've got the Arabian plate. The Athenian plate's actually sharing a plate fra fragment with the Turkish plate here. So what's happening is that there's a lot of movement going on here. The main movement is from south to north. And what it's doing is putting immense pressures on the Athenian plate. And what that does is produce pentelic marble. Beautiful, the beautiful marble that you find in that area. And it, it produces the type, characteristic landscape that you find in Attica. This is the context. This is the physical context. The other part of the physical context is climatology. When I went to school, we would have said this area has a Mediterranean climate. Now we say that it actually has a CSA climate, which means, basically, it's got a Mediterranean climate. <laughs> um, but, but that's important as well because of the impact it has on solar energy. Athens in summer has almost 15 hours of sunlight in a day. Even in winter, it's got nine and a half hours of sunlight. That's at the midwinter solstice. It's a very bright place. And that brightness gives a unique character to these structures. And of course, it's been picked up on by the Acropolis Museum, who makes, that makes very good use of that light as contrasting with the Javine Gallery that has a diffused, anemic type of light. Now, I'm not going to dwell on all of these issues because I want to move on to social media. Uh, but I just want to take you briefly through some of these things. What we can now do because of connectivity and the internet is use authentic materials to tell the stories. And, and this one, this theme, we can tell the stories from carvings, from pots and all sorts of things rather than relying on some teacher's interpretation of ancient Greece. The, the, the students themselves can begin to construct the story. Same with um, everyday life. I mean, the pots are just such an amazing chronicle of everyday life. And all of those themes are dealt with in the Australian curriculum. The, this is fairly traditional stuff. Uh, we'd have to cover it uh, to put Athens in its context. How do we get students working on this material? Well, one of the tools we can use is Wordle. We as teachers can go through all the literature and produce a graphic like this that highlights key concepts that students need to research. Wordle is a very useful thing if it's used correctly. It's a starting point for web-based research. You know, we could be making things like this and disseminating them around the world to teachers. Uh, now, Gina's the one that really understands this. I don't. But all these mathematical expressions that are inherent in the Parthenon are pointing to the golden ratio. I think there are some other people that understand it as well. Uh, I don't get it. All I could do is make the graphic. But, but I, can, I can actually play a little slideshow that points out where these things fit into the Parthenon. You know, I'm not a mathematician. But the ratios are there. And, and presumably, um, there are many more mathematical relationships that I don't know about that some of you who are architects and artists and so forth and mathematicians can probably get. Meanwhile, back in the British Museum, things haven't changed much since the 19th century. It's still a place where Beautiful pieces of art are taken from their contexts and displayed as artefacts. Beautiful as they are, they're stripped of many, many layers of meaning. If you want to have a look at uh, what follows next online, I've got links to all of the tools I'm about to show you uh, in Google Drive. So if you want to... Yeah. Uh, is it the same? No. Uh, it should be pointing to a different document. It links you to a whole series of, um, of Web2 tools that I'm about to... I won't be able to play very much with them because um, I've been having some problems with internet connectivity. In fact, I might have to go out of this in a moment just to see that I do. 
I, I didn't check to see if I was still on. I think I'm still on. Yeah. I'm not sure. Um, if I'm not, I'll come out and collect, connect us. But the first thing I wanted to show you about was show you is this augmented reality link. Um, it's called Thing Link. Any, any one of you can make this. All you have to do is get a picture of the Parthenon and um, go to this link. We'll see if we've got... Oh, we have internet. They didn't give us the proxy settings for the internet here, so I'm going off Genesis 4G. But you see, this is just a simple thing I've, I've knocked up. If you click on this particular link, it takes you through to Costas Gavras's uh, uh, beautiful animated history of the Parthenon. Um, here there's a slideshow from the Greek Ministry of, for Culture. Uh, over here there's just a bit of text detail. Up here, a bit more text from uh, uh, another cultural site. I'll just come back to my slideshow. These are the sorts of tools that we can be producing. These are the sorts of things that we can produce. The next one, uh, I, I love this. I do it all the time. This isn't mine, uh, but I, I've been making them in other parts of the world. Demanda panoramas. Again, something we can, we can create. We can create so that we show the issues we, we, we want to show. And then encourage students to construct their own versions of things like this. Demand it might take a little while to load. Oh, there it goes. This is done just with a, a regular iPhone. Just, just holding an iPhone and moving, or an iPad and moving around like that. And the stability in this is great. Some of the early panorama apps that were on these smart devices were very ordinary. But this one has really taken it to a new level. You can share this on Facebook, you can share it on Twitter, um, you, can, you, know, you can really disseminate it and you can make the points that you want to make about it. Right, next one. Uh, I like this one um, because I'm a still a bit 20th century. Pinterest. Pinterest is a type of uh, dynamic uh, magazine authoring tool. I just put this together in half an hour. And it's, it's really uh, just a series of resources I might use as a starting point for students, student research, student study on this particular topic. Um, it's, it's very simple, each one links to a site uh, and it's a great way of giving an overview. Right, the next one, I'm almost finished here, but I'd like to pose a few questions. Uh, I won't explore this one at the moment, but just copy down its uh, its URL because this is the best virtual exploration of the Acropolis area that I've seen. It's absolutely brilliant. It's from the Hellenic, Hellenic Ministry of Culture. Um, whoever put it together, I don't know, but it's, it, it is absolutely excellent. You can pan and zoom and move around within individual images and, there, and the whole Acropolis area is just uh, has these hot spots all over it that you can, you can use to get a very comprehensive view uh, of the Acropolis. The only reason I'm not showing it is time because I'll, get, I'll start to play with it. Now, this is one that, this isn't directly about the Parthenon, but this, one, this leads me to a point, oh no, I haven't actually, um, am I plugged in here? I want to go back. Let me here. start with this. What we have here is a painting of the great poet Robbie Burns. And it's just a normal image. But if we now switch inputs over to the phone, uh, running our technology, you can see effectively what Tamara is seeing on the screen. And when she points at this image, something magical happens. Now, what's great about this is there's no trickery here. There's, no, um, there's nothing done to this image. And what's great about this is the, the technology is actually allowing the phone to start to see and understand much like how the human brain does. Not only that, but as I move the object around, it's going to track it and overlay that content seamlessly. Again, the thing that's incredible about this is this is how advanced these devices have become. All the processing to do that was actually done on the device itself. 
Now, this has applications everywhere, uh, whether in things like uh, art and museums, like you just saw, or in the world of, say, advertising or print journalism. Museums. Okay, here's a school teacher in the Devine Gallery with her students. Uh, and they're looking at Iris. And she points her smartphone at Iris. Now, who's going to control what that smartphone now plays through the Orasma app? Well, we are. Uh, so, what do we get? That's what happens when you point the smartphone at Iris. Now, because it, it's not just paintings, it's anything. It can be buildings as well that trigger uh, uh, Orasma. And each one of these little episodes is called an aura. So what, it's actually quite, um, what's the word? Seditious. Uh, there's nothing the British Museum could do to stop anyone layering the entire Devine Gallery with um, auras. Nothing. Um, they, they would require images, though, of before and after, wouldn't they? They'd oh, it can be anything. An image of the original. Yeah. And then uh, you can do that in the museum. It could just be a picture from the. Oh, wind up. <laughs> I can talk about it later. Yeah. Okay. So developing auras could be a project. Um, so Google Drive, I won't go into in great detail, but that's another area where an enormous amount of uh, Web2 technology can be employed in this campaign. Because you can store files in the cloud. You can ha have global dialogue between students. Students in Athens could be documenting these things and in contact in real time almost with students in Australia or the United States or Britain, sharing documents, sharing the dialogue, uh, accessing from anywhere, from smartphones and other devices, sharing with whomever they choose and collaborating with whomever they choose to tell the story, with teachers and informed uh, people such as us uh, helping, shaping, facilitating. Uh, a globally connected classroom. That's the 21st century future. That's, how it, that's happening already, and it's happening in particular through the Google's um, uh, tools. So, what are the implications for education, for restitution, for the campaign, for the Greek government, for you, for me? I'd say they're immense. I mean, the, the, the toolkit we now have is suddenly growing exponentially. But I'll leave it at that. I'm, uh, we can talk about more about things like this at some other stage.